Hey guys, welcome back to the Light Lion Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Chris Prosser, joined as always by my trusty sidekick. Um, actually, we discussed last time, I'm the sidekick, uh, Dakota Jacobson. And this week, we have a very special guest. We have Dr. TJ Betts from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, and uh, Dr. Betts, welcome aboard. We are super stoked to have you today. Hey, thank you guys. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. We're really excited to get into today's topic. Um, I'm sure some of our listeners probably looking at the title thinking, "Uh uh-oh, they're talking about the Old Testament. So I'm going to go ahead and (laughs) click skip (laughs) past this one. (laughs) But, but, um, you know, Dr. Betts, when I took your class at Southern OT1, one of your emphasis really was on um, why New Testament Christians should love the Old Testament. That was kind of your theme throughout the whole class, and it really was impactful on me. So I'm hoping... Uh, as a result of today's episode, our listeners will feel the same. But before we get into that, uh, Dr. Betts, why don't you just go ahead and give the listener a little bit of your background, you know, ministry experience. Um, I know you both have pastoral and educational um, experience in ministry. So why don't you just give the listener a little bit of background? Yeah, I, uh, well, I, I'm a sixth generation Southern Baptist um, minister, actually. Um, so wow. it goes to my family. Uh, my mom said I was born on a Thursday and they had me in church on Sunday. So I've, uh, I grew up in church and, um, and so that, that kind of environment has been my entire life, if that makes any sense. And so that says a lot about, uh, where I'm coming from. I think, uh, I started pastoring, um, when I was 23 years old, when I started, I started seminary in January and I started pastoring my first, first church in May. And um, I pastored then three churches all together for about 14 and a half years. And then after that, um, I went to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary um, to be a professor. And I have just finished, uh, well, am finishing this month, 22 years as a professor of Old Testament um, here. And, um, and so that gives a, a little bit of my ministerial background and, uh, and what I'm up to right now. Sure. And you've also uh, written some commentaries. I know I read the Nehemiah commentary for OT1. Are there any other books um, that that you'd like to mention? Yeah, um, I appreciate your asking. I I wrote a a commentary that's uh, on on the book of Amos and uh, it's a little how should I say it? It's uh, it's kind of middle of the road, even more so than the Nehemiah one. And I've heard of uh, like men's Bible studies using it, and um, I'm teaching using it for um, a seminary wives institute at Southern, which is really they're not seminary students, but they're the wives of um, our seminary students, and uh, I, they they really enjoy the the study in the Book of Amos. So that's a a, bu- a book that by Christian Focus that uh, I've written on the Book of Amos. I would. Uh, recommend and uh, then Nehemiah. And then I have a book coming out actually in September, how to teach the old Testament to Christians. And it's geared toward people in the church. Pastors can use it, but it's also geared toward uh, lay people, teachers and such. And, and uh, probably a good part of the book though, as you hit upon Chris is really why, why teach the Old Testament? Why study it? So I spend a lot of time actually in that little book talking about that before actually talking about how, because I think when we get the question why um, down and we really understand why it's important, then it's not so hard to work out how, if that makes any sense. And so that book is coming out. It's by Tyndall and um, it should be coming out on, on the shelves in August, I believe. Or, I'm sorry, in September. I think that's awesome. a really good segue into just jumping right in because you talked about the why of, of why should we study or why should we really care about the Old Testament. I know that I've heard in conversations as, as well as have encountered you know myself in my own study and reading, there always seems to be this tendency. It's not a direct trying to avoid the Old Testament because we understand as believers that the Old Testament is, is inspired um, and, and as important as the New Testament. Yet for some reason, I think it's more of a like silent avoidance of the Old Testament and it might even be subconscious, right? When we open our Bibles and we don't know where to go, we often turn to maybe Romans or the you know one of the Gospels or something like that. Why do you think that is? And kind of in your experience, why have you seen that kind of be the case and for so many Christians to kind of avoid the the Old Testament? Well, I, I think it 
I think it's kind of a top down kind of thing. I don't think uh, we get a lot of preaching from the Old Testament. And, and when we do that, it's, it's kind of hit and miss. Um, even in Sunday school, as I said, my background uh, growing up in a church, we get a lot of stories. But it's kind of like one of my professors said uh, years ago, it's kind of like a shotgun approach. There's you know a story here, a story here, a story here. And there's the, we don't treat the New Testament books that way. We, we usually teach through New Testament books. But with the Old Testament, it's just here and there and all everywhere. So it's very hard to understand, I think, because we don't teach it in context. We don't make, you know, we don't deal with it that way. And and so I think um, it's what you said. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, top down, though. Um, we trust our pastors as we should. So if our pastors are um, pushing or emphasizing certain things, then we trust them and believe these are th- these are important things. So the pastor won't say you don't need to teach or preach or study the Old Testament. I don't think, at least in our circles, they won't say that. But what they'll do is just as you said, ignore it, and that communicates volumes there to people because if it were important, my pastor would would tell us it's important. But because he's not doing that, then it mustn't be important. And so since it's not important, then then why go to it? And so I think that uh, I'm going to put the blame um, on us, uh, uh, those of us who are teaching and, and preaching that uh, that's the case. Now, you know, people have made arguments and it's really true. I, I think the Old Testament is harder to deal with, honestly. Um, I just think the different genres are, are harder. I think uh, narrative is harder. Um, when I went to seminary, um, I went to Southern when it was many years ago in the 80s. It was very liberal at that time. And uh, they would talk about uh, um, what I would call conservatives. They had other names for us. Um, but uh, they would say that uh, we didn't preach the Gospels. Um, but I would say this, that uh, narrative is just harder to preach than Paul. Paul is so easy to preach, isn't he? I mean, he just says, this is the point, And then he makes his point, And then he tells you, this is the point I made. And a lot of the, the New Testament is written that way. But I mean, when you read like Numbers 13 and 14, they're long chapters, but it's one story. And to preach that narrative, I mean, just to read it, if you read the whole thing, you take up about 15 minutes of your sermon time, it would seem like. I mean, and so there's there's just uh, it, it, there are difficulties that that we have in that way as well. And so I, I think that, uh, and again, people, um, say, uh, you know, I just want Jesus. And, and so that becomes an issue if they think that the old Testament really isn't about Jesus or they, they have enough about Jesus and the new Testament that the old Testament is not important to that message. So those are just some of the reasons I think that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It's definitely a pastoral problem when the one standing in the pulpit, the one shepherding the flock, isn't opening his Old Testament to his people, then they're just going to think, well, pastor's not doing it. I don't need to do it. Yeah, and, Chris, um, yeah. Chris I, I tell you, I've, I've asked students, I've been teaching for 22 years, as I said. Um, I've asked several of my students coming into an Old Testament one class, how many of you have come out of churches that regularly, teach and preach the Old Testament from the pulpit, I'd say it's about 40% that would say they come out of backgrounds that do. Uh, yeah. Well, that, yeah, that, that's shockingly low, especially considering that the people you're surveying are students that are in seminary. That's uh, kind of a shocking statistic, but I think it's pretty representative. I'm actually kind of surprised the number's not a little bit lower than that. But I'm being generous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I I believe that. Well, so kind of in the same vein, um, uh, to your comment, Dr. Betts, where you're talking about, well, people say, just give me Jesus. That's a, that's enough for me. And you pointed out that the old, the entire Old Testament, Jesus himself affirmed that the entire Old Testament pointed towards him. And what's co- coincidental about that is Jesus makes that affirmation, of course, in the New Testament. So if you're reading your New Testament, you see in the text itself from the lips of Jesus that the Old Testament is important. But I think on the same sort of path of people just almost being a little bit scared, intimidated, it is a lot harder 
Uh, it requires a lot more focus, a lot more diligence. You have to do a lot more study, especially in the cultural context of which you find yourself in the Old Testament. But I think the number one thing that I've heard personally is people just seem to think that the Old Testament might be outdated, right? I'm sure we've all heard clips where uh, particularly a critic or an atheist might be saying, oh, well, I thought you Christians weren't supposed to wear uh you know, clothes cut from it to fabrics or something like that. And so they'll bring up all these Old Testament laws, and then Christians are like, oh, no, those are outdated. Those don't apply to us anymore. And so why do you – what would you say to that person who says, oh, well, Leviticus, I don't need to read that ever because that law's done away with Christ died. We're not under the law anymore. What would you say to the person who thinks that way? Yeah, um, well, one thing – it's interesting when people say, I just want Jesus and we don't need those things. Uh, Jesus himself makes it very clear that he came to give full expression to the law. And he actually, Jesus, who we tend to, we tend to, to read the new Testament, even how should I say it? Uh, cherry picking a little bit where we, we pick out the things we like about Jesus and the things that Jesus, Jesus is very harsh. Um, about a lot of things that if you hear people talk about Jesus, it's like, have you read w what he has said and what he said? And, and it, but one of the things he, he pronounces a curse on anyone that opposes those who teach the law, which is a strange thing because we, we tell people that the law is passe. Um, one of the things I would say is, is this, that um, first of all, a, a great deal of the law um, and the precepts of the law are reiterated in the New Testament. And I think at nine of the 10 commandments are word for word. And, and the one on the Sabbath, arguably in Hebrews, I think, um, I think he, he expounds it to, to mean more than, than just the day, but our Sabbath is Christ, um, and the rest that we have in him. But, um, so it, it, with that being the case, I would say 10, are, all 10 are, are, are there. So I, I think it's uh, one of these things that when we look at the, the Old Testament, the Old Testament law, one of the reasons I tell my students they should study and teach the Old Testament is because it is God's revelation of himself. And so, yes, we're not under I, my view of the, the law is that if it's not reiterated in the New Testament, then we're not under that law per se. But that doesn't mean we throw it away. Because all of Scripture, according to Paul, which is a New Testament believer, um, and he speaks of Scripture, which is the word they use. And in 2 Timothy 3, he just before that, he says second, um, he calls it the sacred writing. So he's talking about the Old Testament here. He says that it's all inspired and all profitable for believers, for New Testament believers. All means all. So that even means Old Testament laws. And it's interesting, for instance, uh, Paul uses uh, a law in Deuteronomy um, about an ox to uh, argue. He says that this law um, regarding feeding your ox as it treads um, on the threshing floor, that this law was written to us as New Testament believers to learn the principle of paying pastors. And, and, and so it's not to be thrown away. And so I think the question we need to ask of all of Scripture, if it is God's word and it is profitable, what does it reveal about God? Um, all Scripture is God's revelation. So when I read um, a law about, for instance, feeding the ox, for instance, well, I don't own an ox, and that may seem so outdated, but what does it teach about God? In that context, he's, he's saying that you're going to treat your oxen right. You're going to treat people that work for you right. And guess what? In the church, that means you treat those who serve you in the church rightly as well. And, and so all of Scripture is profitable when we look at what is God revealing about himself in it. And so that is something I think that uh, we missed. We just kind of throw it away. We just say it's it's passe, it's old, it doesn't matter. But how can we say that when um, I think of um, I'm going to look up so I, look it up so I say it correctly? Uh, Isaiah 40 verse eight, the prophet said, "The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever." And so 
Paul says that it's all profitable for us, that God's word is eternal, is what we see with the prophet there, Isaiah. And so the question is, how are we profiting from it? So you bring up Leviticus. I would say you don't understand Jesus as well as, as you could and don't know him as well as you should if you don't know Leviticus, because Leviticus introduces what, uh, what it means to have a priest and a high priest. Um, it introduces atonement and explains the need for atonement and the need for a sacrifice and, and a substitute and explains what sin is. And, and there are several, and holiness. If we believe holiness is important, Leviticus teaches what it means for God to be holy, what it means for the people of God to be holy. And, and when we look at the New Testament writers, they just, they write assuming the Old Testament. And so when you and I, if we neglect these things, then we really don't have a great understanding of what they're talking about. So when we see Jesus as prophet, priest, and king, I don't think we really understand what that means about Christ if we don't understand what, what they mean in the Old Testament, which is understood when these things are written. Going back to what you said about people, you know, when they, when they make the comment that they just want Jesus, right? So that's why we stay in the New Testament. I think for, for those who are maybe not as well versed in the Old Testament, I think it's easy to, to have the misconception that Jesus popped up in the New Testament and that's the first time we're kind of seeing him on the scene. Um, do you have some, some kind of examples of that, that kind of just come to the, the top of your mind of instances where it's clear as day, where we see Jesus in the Old Testament, um, whether it be through prophecy or, uh, you know, for the example, we talks about I am, um, things like that, where people can clearly see that Jesus didn't just pop up in, in the beginning of, um, you know, of Matthew. And that wasn't the first time that we saw him on the scene. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to um, go to John. And uh, when he begins his gospel in John 1, he says, in the beginning was the word. Well, right there, the first three words John uses is, is Genesis 1.1. He takes us, as he introduces who Jesus is, he takes us to the first three words in the Old Testament in the beginning. And then what does he say about Jesus? Because he goes on to say, he says in the beginning was the word. He goes on to explain that he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ as he calls him the word. But he says, and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God What? where? In the beginning. He says it again. So he repeats that. And then he says, all things were created through him and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. And so from the get go, he's, the Old Testament starts with Jesus. And, and we, we overlook that, but, but it's interesting. John teaches us, and I think the apostles should be the ones who teach us how to read our Bibles. And it, when we look to the apostles in the New Testament, there are nearly, I don't have the exact number right off the top of my head, but there are nearly 8,000 verses in the New Testament. Um, of the 8,000 verses, um, about 1,000 of them are either quotations, partial quotations, allusions to the Old Testament. So one in eight verses we read in the Old Testament are looking back to the Old, are in the New Testament, are looking back to the Old Testament. And so I, I think that um, when you see, if people say, give me Jesus, well, you want to start in the beginning because that's where he is. And um, it, it, it is interesting that uh, we see Paul um, talking about Jesus is that rock in the wilderness. And so we see um, pictures of this, but we see so many also prophetic uh, um, uh, utterances speaking of the Messiah coming, and they're explicit about these things, but also there are implicit things that we see. And it, it is interesting, you brought up I am. I had a person years ago say that nowhere in, in the Bible does Jesus call himself God. And it indicated this person did not know their Old Testament, because if they knew their Old Testament, they would know why the people of Nazareth wanted to stone Jesus, because he said, I am. He called himself, I am. Well, he's he's calling himself Yahweh, the, the, the covenantal name of the Lord um, from the Old Testament, from Exodus. 
And so it's just those things you see that when you start any story, when you start a story, does it make sense to start in the middle or does it make sense to start the beginning? And when you read it from the beginning, as John tells us we should, I think, as he points to that, then when it happens, it comes. And let me share an experience I had. I went to several years ago to Niger and um, I had a translator with me, but uh, the people I was with, uh, we sto- we did what they called storying through the Bible. We, we started with creation and told what we would say are the major stories in the Bible. And so as I was um, talking to a group of mostly women at the a, a well, of all things, it's not the woman at the well, but uh, about 50 <laughs> women at a well um, in the middle of the day, as I was speaking to them, um, when I came to the birth of Christ, all of a sudden they started, they were all quiet up, up until that point. And they kept, all of a sudden they started just talking to each other and, and jabbering. And I'm looking, I'm like, what did I say? You know, what, what happened here? And I turned to the translator. I said, what's going on? And he said, they're saying it's him. It's him. And what they understood is the promise made in Genesis 3 of the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent and that promise seed going through the Old Testament stories, when I came to Christ, they naturally, they just got it. They just said, oh, there he is. That's the one he's been talking about. And it was just a wonderful experience to actually see that with people who had never heard before. And um, and so I think that's what's meant by the all of Scripture, that that it's given to us as it is so that we could read it that way. I love that you touch on that because one of the classes that I took at DTS was called Story of Scripture uh, by Dr. Mark Yarbrough, and he really goes into the the emphasis of looking at Scripture as one kind of cohesive story, right? He says that in church, we've been given a lot of kind of puzzle pieces throughout our time in, in church, but putting those together and understanding that it's making this grand picture, sometimes we're, we're not able to see that. Um, and use the word covenant, which I love, because if we don't understand the covenant you know, the, the uh, what is it, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, all these covenants and, and their role in the Old Testament and the new covenant that was, um, I believe it's Jeremiah that's talked about, then it's, it almost is like we jump into the New Testament with, like, like you said, starting maybe halfway in the story or starting a movie halfway through. Um, how do you think people are shortchanged by, by starting halfway through? Obviously, you're still going to get the value and the content of the, the New Testament, but you, you're, you're leaving some stuff out for sure. Yeah, uh, and it is interesting you bring that up because the very first verse in the New Testament, Matthew 1, 1, says the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What He's pointing to those two eternal covenants that God made um, in preparation and anticipation of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, it, it, we see that uh, there. Um I, I see it this way, and I'm, I'm going to give you an illustration, I guess, with this. My my son and I, well, my, both my sons, when they were little, they're grown men now. Um, but when they were little, after um, church on Sunday nights in the summer, we had a, a local uh, drive-in, and we would often go to that. And uh, there was a superhero movie on. We were in line and, and out on the road. And it was a long line. I didn't realize. And so we weren't getting in on time, but we could listen to the uh, movie start on the radio. So we're listening and there are all these explosions and all this stuff going on. And um, I, they were little guys and they're like, Dad, what's going on? What's going on? And I I don't know what's going on. All we heard were these explosions and all this stuff. We got in and the whole rest of the movie, the good guys were trying to find out what the what happened with the bad guys as well. And we never did know, although the good guys won, they got the bad guys and and that was fine. Probably about six months later, I was in my study at home and uh, my youngest son came running, bursting into my office and he had a a DVD in his hand. And he said, Dad, I finally found what happened. And for all those months, it had just been weighing on him what happened in that movie at the beginning that caused all this ruckus. And that's, that's the same thing I see. It, 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 of course, 
the incarnation of Christ, the, the birth of Christ, the life of Christ, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ, this is the high point of all of history. Who knows? The second coming may, may you know, outdo it. I, I don't know. But it, it is the one climactic point. But I tell you what, there's better understanding and better appreciation and even greater rejoicing in what happens and what we see in the coming of Christ when we begin at the beginning and we see why it's significant and, and understand the significance of it. And, and I think we miss that. And uh, it's not uh, it, the person who says, I want to know Jesus. It's they don't know him as well as they could, I would say. And I say that softly. I don't want to be antagonistic, but but the story of Jesus begins in Genesis 1 1. And um, and we we miss that. And I think it's it's uh, to our detriment. It, it's it's not what's best. Sure. When I think, too, whenever we read our New Testament, yes, we're not knowing Jesus a, as much, but I think. Also, as we say in New Testament, if we're not familiar with the Old Testament, we can actually end up misinterpreting a lot in the New Testament. And an example that comes to my mind is, you know, one of the most famous sayings that Jesus has on the cross, my God, my God, you know, why have you forsaken me? Well, if you haven't read your Old Testament, you don't know about David and the Psalms and his suffering. Well, you're going to read that and think to yourself, well, I thought Jesus was God. What? Why is he saying, my God, my God? You know, and so I think there's definitely a practical implication. Uh, Dr. Betts, I want to get your, this is kind of a quick detour. I want to get your thoughts on this. So I took gospels with uh, Mike Kruger when I was at RTS and he made an argument that Mark 1, 1, when it says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, son of God, and then he has those quotations of, I think it's Malachi and then Isaiah. He made an argument that what Mark is saying in effect is the gospel of Jesus doesn't start in the new Testament. It starts in the Old Testament. Do you find that to be, have you heard that before? Do you find that to be convincing? Well, uh, yeah, I've not heard it said that way with Mark, but um, I did a faculty address last uh, August, actually, it'd be just about a year now at the Southern. And I, I talked about how all four of the gospel writers begin with the Old Testament. All four, if you look at the, their introductions, all four of them do this. And so um, I, I would just say the story of Jesus begins in Genesis 1 1. And, and if we want to call that the gospel or what have the, the whole story begins in the Old Testament. So certainly I agree with him um, with that, that the gospel writers, they begin with the Old Testament because they believe that's where the story of Jesus begins. And it's it's not just Mark. Mark does that. But um, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, all four of them actually do that. And uh, you can go and see that they're, they're all quoting the Old Testament to show who Jesus is. And so certainly I, I agree with that, that take on that. Sure. Well, as we're coming up <clears throat> on our time here. Um, I'm sure there have been some listeners who were maybe listening to today and they're like, man, <laughs> need to open the Old Testament, you know, need to start in Genesis and work my way through. I'll just say as a preface to this, what I'm, uh, the question I'm about to pose is, um, and Dr. Betts, I attribute a lot of this to your class because I felt really convicted, especially reading um, the Learning to Love the Old Testament, or that little booklet, The Learning to Love the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, it, it's huge, pr uh, a huge practical help for me, really convicted me. And as I've read the Old Testament now, I actually find a lot of joy, even in the passages where I get horribly confused, like I just finished reading Ezekiel, where there's like eight chapters of the vision of the new temple. And it's like, this was 500 cubits. This, was, you know, and you're kind of reading it and you feel a little overwhelmed because you're like, ah, oh, man, I, I don't understand the importance, but I know it's important because all scripture is God breathed. Right. Um, but for the listener who heard today's episode and they maybe feel convicted now, like, hey, I need to get in the Old Testament, obviously apart from starting in Genesis, what are some ways that that person might begin their journey in the Old Testament and not beginning it in a way where they feel like, man, this is a drag. I don't really want to do this. How can they learn to love reading the Old Testament, especially if they haven't really read it before? Yeah, well, 
I, I do um, encourage starting in Genesis, um, but here's a question I would, I, and I tell my students, um, I wish I were younger when I discovered this and really it's not earth shaking, but it's something I didn't do when I, for years, since I was a, a child, actually, I would do devotions and, and I'd always pray this before I read the scripture, God, what does this have to do with me? And so, and, and my, my desire was to be obedient, if that makes, and that's a, that should be our desire. So I want to be obedient. So what does this have to do with me? And um, it dawned on me one day as I was reading my scriptures that, you know what, this isn't about TJ Betts. Um, it, it's God's revelation of himself, first and foremost. I'm not the center of this universe, although um, I tend to act like it is, um, uh, that I am the, the center of it, but no. Um, and so I would just, as I read um, through it, and I, and I would just take it slowly, not not try to, you know, do too much, but just start in Genesis and just say, what does this what is God revealing about himself? What, what, what do I learn about who God is? And just begin to focus on that, realizing that Jesus is God and Jesus gives full expression to all these things. When, you know, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen what? The father, you see? And I think that goes the other way around. If you've seen the father, you've seen Christ. And so when you look in the Old Testament and say, what does this reveal about God, who he is? I think that's a good way to just read your scriptures and especially in the Old Testament. And there may be things that you don't understand, but I think there will be enough that you do understand. Um, you know, I may not understand um, why the boundary markers were what they were with the divisions of the tribes and all that. But I can understand this, that God promised these people that he would give them to them. And he did. And he was faithful and it wasn't just theoretical, but God. So when we read the tedium to us, it's just tedious, but to them, it's showing that God to the last detail is faithful to his promises. And it's not, it's not a small thing. And, and even when we read genealogies, it's like, oh my goodness, all these genealogies. But what it shows is this. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be eager to see our name and hear our name called out, right? Um, and so when we read these genealogies, it's saying God's faithful to real people in real time. And these, they're just names to us, but they're real people that God made promises to and was faithful to keep those promises. And the God who is faithful to these people is the God who's faithful today to us and, and going forward. And so I would just ask that question. And um, it, it's it's interesting, Chris. You mentioned I, I have it here. It's um, Matir's loving the Old Testament that you're talking about, um, and uh, that's a book I would recommend. It's it's an easy read. I know you read it, and for anyone that that wants to just how should I think about the Old Testament, and how can I gain a better appreciation? I think this his tiny book. I, I love anything that Alec Matir put out. And it's M O T Y E R. It's uh, Matir is how you say it, but it looks like Motier or something like that. But um, I think that's a good book also to help you um, as you think about things as you're reading through it. So those are a couple of things I would say. That's so good. That's so good. I feel like that's a perfect way to end it too, a perfect summary. Dr. Betts, we, uh, we can't say thank you enough for, for your time and, uh, and your expertise on this. It's been so incredibly helpful, and I know it's been very encouraging. Uh, to us and, and is going to be to the listener as well. Is there anywhere, um, I know you, we kind of touched on this in the, in the beginning, but any books, any websites, um, any resources that uh, you want to kind of uh, shout out before we, uh, before we let you go? Uh, you know, I've, I've put enough plugs in already, I think. So uh, I, I don't have anything more. Um, I mean, any information you want uh, on Southern Seminary's website. So I'll put a plug in for Southern. Um, that It's a great place to be. Um, it's exciting. God's doing great things and students that we have are just such a blessing. And, and, uh, so anyone that is looking to do seminary education, I think it would be a place that uh, they would be thoroughly blessed uh, to be a part of. So I'll put a plug in for Southern, um, uh, with that. Perfect. I second Perfect. that endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, uh, really appreciate it. Once again, guys, if y'all enjoyed this episode today, please uh, feel free to share with friends and family, like and subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, rate it, leave a review, 
Um, follow us on Instagram, Light and Lion Podcast. And until next time, guys, keep growing in knowledge to the glory of God. We'll see you all next time.